Yeah, so I think, um, so the title was Doing No Harm and Widening the Window, and I make reference to that um, during it. So it was a systematic review of the efficacy of MBIs for PTSD, examining what, what works, why, and what might need to be changed. Um, so if you wouldn't mind moving to the introduction, please, Jane. Okay, so I'm going to spend, I'm just going to put on my own clock here, I'm just going to spend um, a bit of time on this slide um, because it, it's very um, relevant to what comes later. So the, to the background of this, so I had um, personal experience of an impaired autonomic nervous system, ANS, and challenges with mindfulness med meditation practices. So at the time, I found um, um, standard um, practices very difficult and some of them were actually even unhelpful. And only for I had years of experience at the time, I adapted the practices to suit my needs. But the experience left me really wondering, um, I suppose, the suitability of standard MBIs for those with a certain degree of ANS dysfunction. Um, so AN ANS dysfunction is a core feature of many conditions, especially stress and trauma related disorders, including post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. So um, stress and trauma related disorders are a diagnostic category in and of itself. Um, there are a number of disorders in there, including post PTSD. Um, these are separate to anxiety and depression, which are in, in other categories. So just to um, have some notes here, I'm going to refer to, so just to put in context what ANS dysfunction is. So um, it's kind of, it, it acts unconsciously and it's the part of the nervous system that um, you know, keeps us functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. It keeps us surviving. Um, and it's very robust. Um, it works very well. Um, it, it's we're wired to handle stress acutely. Um, so it has two arms, the sympathetic arm um, and the parasympathetic arm. So for daily functioning and in yeah, situations... Love, do you know where any more about it, Liz? Do you borrow it, love? Well, you're on the thing box. No. The, the shelves the Yeah. Hi, um, folks, could you make sure that everybody turns their um, microphone uh, to silent, please? Thank you. So, um, so just to contextualize what ANS dysfunction is, so we we're talking about the, the sympathetic arm and parasympathetic arm. So normally, day to day, dealing with acute stress, the sympathetic arm becomes mobilized and it, it, it gets the body ready for fight or flight, um, you've got cardiovascular respiratory um, changes, um, you would have um, the hormonal uh, changes, adrenaline, cortisol, norepinephrine in, into the body, um, the muscles are are, um, uh, are tensed up, uh, ready to, to flee or to, sorry, to fight or flight. And then when that acute stress passes, the parasympathetic arm kicks in and it restores the body to homeostasis by resting and digesting and um, essentially bring the body back to, to normal functioning. And this system works really well for all of us um, most of the time. The problem, um, so dysfunction or impairment, they're used interchangeably, can set in when, when there's a period of chronic stressors. So you may have uh, one traumatic stressor or you can have a, um, a, so a sustained or prolonged period of successive stressors. It could be um, small teas. So the body doesn't really get a chance to come back to homeostasis. And that's at a certain point for some people, um, a dysfunction would set in. And what this means is that either the sympathetic arm or the parasympathetic arm can become um, chronically activated. So the system is unable to reset itself to homeostatic points. And um, these are um, whole system disorders. So in ANS dysfunction, there are very few parts of the, the system that aren't or can't or may not may not be affected. Um, so and it impacts the brain and the body and it results in brain changes, chronic symptoms and a low window of tolerance. So if you have uh, the sympathetic arm is, is aroused um, chronically, you know, you may have uh, physical symptoms like a lot of anxiety, um, kind of hyperactivity, um, fatigue, pain, dizziness, um, hypertension, cardiovascular issues. Um, and on the other hand, um, with the hypo functioning, so the parasympathetic dominance, you could have the opposite effect. So you have very, um, very lethargic kind of um, emotion, emotionally numb, 
um, kind of depressive symptoms, uh, no energy, um, fatigue. And um, so uh, these, it's a very physical condition. And um, because the brain is, is um, affected as well, uh, a key hallmark would be poor emotional regulation. So the body or the brain, um, so we have three main um, brain uh, changes that happen. So um, you have the amygdala. So the amygdala is like the, the brain, um, kind of the threat center of the brain. And during a period of successive uh, stressors or chronic stress, the amygdala becomes bigger in size. And we can see that in MRIs and the prefrontal cortex, which is more the rational part in the hippocampus, which would normally kind of rein in the amygdala, they get smaller. So you can see how um, the brain is out of whack. And so you may have like behavioral changes, for example, like um, irrational, something may be very irrational or reckless behavior. And it's not that they, um, they may, so they may know what's happening, but they effectively may not have the ability uh, to dampen that down because of these brain changes. Um, and as a result, through all of this, there's a very low window of tolerance. So um, individuals have individual windows of tolerance and it's basically the space within which you're able to cope with you know, normal stressors. And with all of the, the sensitization of the system, the window of tolerance in people who have a um, severe ANS dysfunction, it gets very small. And what this means is that um, uh, basically, the system is hypersensitized to stress and, and basically things that you would have found previously um, fine become very stressful. So along with the internal uh, stressed out system, physiologically, external things um, become really overwhelming and hard to deal with. So the system is basically on all the time with a very low window of tolerance. Um, so given the significant cognitive and physiological dysfunction present, um, the question therefore that I had was, should MBI, MBIs be adapted for these disorders, as has was done, for example, with depression, MBCT, and substance misuse, um, MBRP. So initially, I wanted to focus on ANS dysfunction in general and the ability or the potential of an, of an MBI to go some way towards um, resetting that um, those homeostatic, homeostatic points. But because ANS dysfunction is, is part of so many conditions um, outside of stress and trauma-related disorders, I mean, the list is as long as your arm. You're talking about cardiovascular issues, um, diabetes, um, fibromyalgia. They're talking about the core element of, of uh, long COVID now that my the scope is too broad. And what I did notice was PTSD, um, a lot of research and funding has been put into treating that. So I decided to focus on that for a number of reasons. First of all, because it's the most funded in research, and that's largely due to the its it, its military origins. Um, conventional treatments have had limited efficacy in treating um, PTSD, and interest has turned to MBIs as adjunctive treatments. I I know I note adjunctive treatments, so not to replace um, core treatments, but as add, add on treatments. So the for, currently and for a long time now, the first line treatments for PTSD would be um, the exposure-based psychological therapies and pharmaceutical therapies, uh, if, if needs be. Um, and they have had limited efficacy, so they still have high dropout rates. And I think as many as two thirds of um, veterans anyway, post-treatment still have a PTSD diagnosis. And in fairness, PTSD is very complex. It's a heterogeneous disorder and it's very difficult to treat. And it may require a multifaceted approach. So interest is turned to mindfulness meditation um, as adjunctive treatments for a number of reasons. Firstly, because they are thought to target both top-down and bottom-up processing. So when we talk about top-down and bottom-up, we're referring to the upper and lower parts of the brain. And traditionally, generally, um, psychological treatments target the more rational cognitive top-down upper part of the brain, like the neocortex, whereas the bottom-up part of um, the the, the brainstem levels and um, somatic processing really needs to be targeted with PTSD to address the whole physiological arousal. And it is thought that psychological treatments are limited in targeting that. And that's a role which MBIs may be able to play. And I think Amanda is going to talk about more about that in her presentation. So, and I, there, because there is significant overlap between the etiological underpinnings and the, symp the symptomology of PTSD and other similar disorders, 
I thought that examining the research in MBIs with PTSD might be the most insightful in terms of treating the underlying illness dysfunction present. So, and just a quick note, I'm watching the time here on PTSD um, as a controversial diagnosis. So PTSD is relatively new as a, a, a diagnostic um, disorder since 1980 in the DSM in America. And at the time it was brought about largely, it had a lot of military um, influence with the Vietnam vets lobbying of the seventies, um, as opposed to any really largely medical consensus. And the debate um, is still ongoing today about the, the relevance of um, the criteria A. So to have PTSD, you have to meet quite a lot of categories of, uh, of several criteria. And the main one that differentiates is criteria A. So you have to have a significant traumatic stressor. And a lot of um, critics are saying that it's not really suitable for um, fit for purpose to the type of life that we're living. And the question is around what constitutes a traumatic stressor in that, you know, things outside of um, war and rape and sexual assault, that there are many other things which can tip somebody into PTSD. And the relevance of that is that because the prevalence of people who have, they call it sub, sub partial or, clin or subclinical PTSD, um, is quite is very high. So the amount of people who don't have a diagnosis, but either have PTSD or have a lot of post-traumatic stress symptoms, um, they're not being diagnosed or they're being diagnosed with other issues. And the fear, I suppose, or the risk is that in every mindfulness class or course and an MBI course, there may be somebody there who doesn't have PTSD, but is nevertheless high, a highly traumatized individual. So we're talking at the very least yeah, about trauma informed teachers and the, the risk of um, minimizing or of or of trying to um, address um, those risks of adverse effects and doing harm. So the purpose of the dissertation was to examine the efficacy of MBIs and PTSD, PTSD to learn what works, why and what might need to be changed. Um, next slide, please, Jane. spend too much too long on the next one because it's fairly self-explanatory so I had one main objective and that was to examine the quantitative efficacy of MBI so the, the actual outcomes from from randomized control trials and secondary objectives that I wanted to look at were number one are there specific facets of mindfulness that are particularly effective in treating PTSD so not to go into too much detail but some of you might know the facets of mindfulness that are are are, are, um, are measured before pre and post um, are observing, describing, acting with awareness, non-judging of experience and non-reactivity. So they are, they are me measurable and they are thought to have an influence, uh, not positive or negative, we don't know, on the symptom clusters of PTSD, which are intrusions, avoidance, change in the mood and cognition and hyperarousal. They wanted to see if there was a cause and effect there. Um, secondly, is there evidence of the respective neurobiological mechanisms involved? So on this point, we're talking about the parts of the brain which are known now to be implicated in uh, PTSD, and I kind of referred to some of them earlier, the size of particular um, brain areas. And the third one was, is there evidence of aspects of MBI that need to be adapted? So there I'm looking at dropout rates, adverse effects um, amongst the participants. Um, so I, I uh, did a mixed method study design, qualitative, qu sorry, quantitative or, or CTs and qualitative studies. And just to note here, initially, I kind of um, was somewhat dismissive of qualitative studies until my, I had a chat with my supervisor and she advised me to look at the qualitative and she was absolutely right because the insight from the qualitative studies and the lived experience of participants was really um, absolutely key. So I picked a systematic review because um, I was examining a body of existing published work. Uh, it's considered to be the best way to objectively appraise and synthesize the findings of several studies relating to a specific question and questions. And they follow an explicit systematic protocol. So they are, you know, people can see what I've done and they outline detailed procedural steps. So it was very clear how I came about the, it was like what the research shows. Um, so all in all, I had 29 studies um, were included, 21 quantitative, three qualitative, two mixed methods and three meta-analyses. And the dissertation goes into kind of the inclusive and exclusive criteria. It had to be eight weeks, had to be an MBI. Everybody had to have a, 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 um, a PTSD diagnosis through a validated um, method of, of a, a diagnostic method. Yeah. Next slide, please, Jane. 
So this is the findings. Um, so in the primary objective, the quantitative results um, from the RTCs, so the majority of the MBI demonstrated superior e efficacy uh, with generally small to medium effect sizes. Um, just to note, MBSR was the most commonly used MBI, um, 13 out of 19 primary studies. Studies included populations with PTSD from, a diverse, from diverse types of traumatic experiences. So we had combat PTSD, PTSD from traffic accidents, interpersonal violence, childhood um, sexual and physical abuse and refugees who had had um, trauma from various sources there across different cultures and settings from various um, countries, suggesting that MBIs may be both amenable and effective with various population types and various trauma types. However, this is a, a big, however, um, caution is necessary when interpreting the results. So half of almost half of the primary studies were with veterans and it's known that previous, it's very likely that, pre, that uh, veterans would have had previous education or treatment with PTSD. So it's hard to know whether the outcomes with veterans would be the same with people who haven't had previous um, PTSD treatment or education. And it's also not known if combat PTSD or the effects there is generalizable to the outcomes with other, with other forms of PTSD or whether they need a tailored approach. There were small sample sizes, uh, mostly male, I think 72%. Mixed quality of studies, um, previous uh, treatment for PTSD was unknown, the levels, uh, the dosage and intensity and completion rate definition varied and sometimes giving the MBI comparative advantage. I'll speak about that in the next slide. Uh, the type and strength of the control condition, this was very significant because um, the more specific and evidence-based control, the lower the effect size of the MBI. And as regards to secondary objectives, so there's a lack of evidence on the cause of links between uh, um, individual facets of mindfulness and specific PTSD clusters. Uh, findings show promise regarding the increasing evidence of the underlying neurobiological mechanisms. Um, albeit only three studies examined this uh, with MRI and PTSD. Or sorry, not with PTSD, with um, MRI and PET scan. And MBIs were generally well tolerated. However, the dropout rates were high, higher, as high, or if not higher than um, psychological trauma focused therapies. And adverse, adverse effects were experienced, some of which were serious. Um, participants in MBIs with trauma sensitive modifications appeared to have less serious A &E, or adverse effects, yet they still had challenges. Um, and for example, some of the challenges were they found it very overwhelming. This is generally. Um, Triggered panic attacks, um, dissociation with body scan, um, increase in depression. Um, there were a number of psychiatric cases, suicidal ideation, and one suicide attempt. They were quite serious. Um, next slide, please, Jane. Um, so the conclusion is the MBIs for PTSD have not yet been rigorously tested, and it's possible that claims of their superior efficacy have been overstated. So generally, the uh, best um, or the most evidence-based um, control was um, person-centered group therapy, which was actually um, a control which was um, which came about to test actually um, uh, exposure-based psychotherapy. So it's it's a pretty good test. Um, but in cases, in some cases, I found that where in where um, person-centered group therapy was the control. Um, MBI was, even though it was found to be superior, it had more sessions and some of them were of more duration and an extra day at the end. So uh, the duration and intensity um, of, of each of the MBI and the control, they weren't the same given the MBI non-fair advantage. So claims of its superiority are overstated. We need more RCTs using gold standard evidence-based first-line treatments for PTSD as a control for MBIs such as prolonged exposure therapy in EMDR. Intervention should be equally matched in terms of dosage and intensity. Um, priority needs to be given in elucidating the individual facets of mindfulness that correlate with change in PTSD. And again, so some studies claimed very loosely um, without any evidence that, say, for example, um, the non-judging aspect of an MBI or mindfulness meditation practice brought about um, uh, a, a decrease in the avoidance a symptom of PTSD, but there really wasn't any evidence to back that up. And the issue is until we know exactly what component of mindfulness is bringing about an effect in a particular symptom cluster of PTSD, we don't know how to tailor specific meditation practices 
and we don't know if they're having positive or negative effects. So basically, we don't know what we're working with. Um, so that really needs to be, but it's difficult to ascertain that, but the work needs to be done. Um, the importance of longitudinal multi-method approaches. So RCTs are limited in providing comprehensive insight into the effects of an intervention. Um, so basically, so in some couple of cases, the quantitative effects um, showed no change, but yet the qualitative studies um, showed that participants actually felt much better. Now, that could be that the symptoms didn't change, but they felt better able to cope. Um, and also, in one case, the, they had no statistically significant outcome, the MBI. But yet the, the MRI showed um, changes in the brain that were going in the right direction. So I think a three-pronged approach is really needed to get really insight into exactly what's going on. We can't rely on one single approach. And the most important um, implication of this SRI was or is concerned for the safety of participants. Um, it, I did recommend that MBIs are adapted for this population. Um, emphasis needs to be placed on practices and tools that cultivate safety and the skills of containment so the participants can learn to stabilize symptoms and tighten their experience before engaging in extended mindfulness practices. And this comes back to, I think, the ability of um, the bottom up and top down um, processing and an approach that targets both because until the physiological arousal in, is addressed that that uh, brainstem level uh, somatic sensory processing it's very difficult actually for some participants to engage in kind of the higher the higher level cognitive based psychothera psychotherapeutic practices um so what we really want to do, and sorry, I'm looking at time there just to some, to some important point, is that with the low window of tolerance, we want to help participants, first of all, to acknowledge where their window of tolerance is, and then to very gently, through mindfulness meditation approaches possibly, just learn to stabilize that. Because as soon as you go outside of that, the distress and panic kicks in. So these could be done by just bringing those up front in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the MBI, and really staying with those until that they're stabilized for each person so that they are empowered to know um, and they feel safe that if they go outside of that for whatever reason, that their, their ability to regulate that and to tighten that experience, um, that they're skillful at doing that. Um, other examples were giving psychoeducation and PTSD to normalize the experience. That was found really helpful. Um, I'm still amazed at the amount of people who, um, even with the diagnosis, they don't really are not people haven't had an explanation about what exactly what's going on. And participants found that really helpful. And this includes informing them that certain practices may be challenging them and then advising them, supporting them of how to address this. Um, changing the sequencing of practices or so shorter practices for those experiencing um, concentration attention issues. Uh, more guidance on the exercise in advance, such as um, how long it's going to be in the structure. Minimization of periods of long silence for those who may lack the regulatory skills to manage um, such distress. Options for keeping eyes open, open and closed, sitting and lying down. When your system is highly uh, mobilized, your posture you may not be able to um, sit up or, or lie down. Um, some more options, trauma sensitive language, sociocultural sensitive adaptations, and the role of the teacher is, is highly significant. Um, they, these, there were some trauma therapists on board. These were all PTSD um, classes, participants. Um, so at the very minimum, really at this stage, if we can go towards that, um, um, teachers need to be trauma informed um, on courses that, that um, never mind that are specifically for this audience, but in general, everyday mindfulness meditation um, practices and MBIs. So safety first and do no harm. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jacqueline. What a really interesting um, study and really comprehensive as well. That was absolutely fantastic. Right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to stop recording for now.